Research Analyst Director at Secunia Denmark. Grüezi, herzlich willkommen. Guten Tag. Dr. Stefan Frey. Uh, welcome everybody. It's nice to be back in Switzerland. This time as a tourist you have to rent the car and go to a hotel, but um, I'm glad I can use my native language when I'm around. So, welcome to my talk, Fixing Fundamental Failures of Endpoint Security. Uh, what we look at is mostly at the uh, data from uh, Secuna PSI, which is a free tool that enumerates endpoints. So we know exactly what people have installed and we can correlate this information with vulnerability intelligence to find out what are the threats out there. But to put all this information and massive data mining into perspective, we first look at what is the changing threat environment. I have a live demo, show you how we can Trojanize, how easy it is to Trojanize uh, software and to use it. Fingers crossed it works, it's always tricky with live demonstrations. Then we look at the complexity of endpoints from the data, what we found, what we can learn from it and how we can uh, defend ourselves. So, what I'll demonstrate if it works is how to construct a Trojan. What I have here is a, a Trojan construction kit. It was freely available on the internet, I found it. Uh, everybody can find it. Usually the latest version uh, is, is a pay version, but the second latest version is for free, so cyber criminals, as they are in a very tough competitive market, they can show and demonstrate how to use uh, their stuff. I will demonstrate that I only use my right hand to Trojanize the well-known program Minesweeper. So the main technical skills when using this construction kit was to find out where I can change the language from Portuguese to English. So here this is the console. If uh, I'm successful, all my drones will report to here and then can select how to remotely control them. So we do a, a create a, no, a new Trojan. So I tell it on what domain names or on what IP addresses it should report back to the, uh, to the creator, to me. So that could be any IP address, domain name, I can use domain flux, whatever defense mechanisms needed to have a robust botnet. Then very important, I identify my drone, so I have different campaigns, I want to know which campaign is uh, reporting back and I protect it, my Trojan with a password, because the bots I create, I want to control them. I don't want anybody else or my competitors to take hold on the botnet that I invested in. Then uh, I can choose how to install the server, in what directory, what the file name shall be. I have uh, certain options how it can be started with, uh, with the reboot or it shall not be started on reboot. Then the most important part is here, the, the payload. So I choose a file, I say from my clean directory, I say I, I use Minesweeper, uh, put it into the root directory and then execute it normally when, uh, uh, when the Trojan is activated. Basically here I Trojanize. You see that I can Trojanize anything, any executable. So if you have a nice tool like a diving calculator, a bookkeeping program, whatever, it's such easy, or so easy to Trojanize it. So we want to stay alive, there's antivirus out there, there are firewalls, IDS, IPS, virtual uh, malware detection and so on. I have here some flags, I say please don't show the malicious behavior if you detect that you are run into a virtual machine because researchers very often use virtual machines to analyze uh, malware or there are many uh, virtual machine based uh, dynamic malware uh, detection tool, so it's very easy, I just disable them. If it runs in VMware, bang, just show the Minesweeper, don't show the malicious behavior, which makes it very hard for the defenders to detect these creations. Some other options, keylogger, yes please. This is the file name, this is not a very fancy name, but it's okay for a, for a demonstration. Hide the files, delete on start, do I want the Trojan to be persistent, yes or no, and so on. Very easy, only with the click of the mouse. I have some alert boxes that can pop up, say if I infect you through a browser vulnerability and this would need the restart of the browser, I can first show you a message to uh, deceive you. So like security information, your browser will be restarted to load new settings, so the user that gets infected knows now, okay, he's getting more protection. Blacklist, here I blacklist some processes, 
when the Trojan is started, it will try very hard to kill those processes and stop certain services. The processes could be like antivalware, antivirus and whatever products I want to be killed in order to stay resident on, on my victim. At the end I have an overview. I create the server, I call it WinMind Spynet, create. I save the settings so if I do the next Trojan I don't have to type in everything again. And this goes into the infected folder. Oh no, this is the, the settings. So, now it is created. So, what I do now, I have my own wireless network, small network, right here. And I have this computer here. Uh, check whether or not I have uh, internet access or access to my network. Uh, so. Okay, so uh, I don't infect it using a vulnerability, we don't have too much time, but you see I have here the calculator started, it's in, on my kill list and I have here the executable, so when I start it, uh, it is killed and I have my Minesweeper. And you see here, now it reported back. Now let's see what we can do, I will... Uh, Those tools are not Trojans, they are also called RED or Remote Administrative Tools. They are very easy to install and very, very powerful. So I can read the clipboard, uh, I have the file manager, I can see any files on there, I can, I can search for files, like uh, let's search for JPEGs or for PowerPoint files. So uh, we can continue while it is searching. Process manager, I see all the processes, I can kill them. I can uh, start some, 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 something here, like Internet Explorer. I have full control. I see this process here in red, this is where the Trojan is injected. I better do not kill it, else I lose control of my uh, network or of my, of my Trojan. Uh, I can capture the desktop, so we do that here, then we can stop it here. So perhaps you can hand it around if somebody just would log into their Google account. We have very uh, many nice features. So you see, it's very easy. I have full control, and I did not need any kind of expertise to construct that. The big question now is. Why do we have tools like this? <laughs> so you see, I intercept the microphone, I intercept the webcam, no installation needed, very low footprint. Okay, so let's go to the presentation. Boop. So where are we? Why do we have tools like this? So, to understand it better, let's first look at uh, how cybercrime or the threat have involved. We can map it on two dimensions if we have the attacker's expertise on the x-axis and the motivation behind <coughs> uh, activities on the y-axis. We can easily identify two areas. So if script kitties do not work for finances, this is vandalism. It's not such a big issue. If we have financial gain involved, then we have the whole scale of technical expertise that is behind it. And what we find is that experts are the authors of the tools, like the one we have shown here, that are very easy to use. And experts working for personal gain, this is the fastest growing segment. This leads to the situation that tools created by the experts are available to less skilled attackers and they are used and misused for financial gain. So, everybody can use it, this leads to opportunistic attacks and so on, and we have very refined tools. The other important step to understand is how can malware bypass antivirus? So malware can systematically bypass antivirus and to understand how, we have a look at the malware development lifecycle. So first you create your original malware with your keylogger, remote control capabilities and so on, as we have seen. 
Step two is very important. What you do then is you create tens of thousands of permutations. So each new sample looks different, but it retains the original malicious functionality. This is to obfuscate it and to make it harder to detect by antivirus and other defense technology. So now you have automatically created 10,000 samples. What you do then, you do quality assurance. You test all your samples against all known, up-to-date anti-malware and antivirus products. The samples that fail, they go back, you create new permutations, and the samples that pass, which means that they are not detected, they are used in the deployment. So if you're attacked today, there's a high chance this happened before and that the malware that is used against you has been tested to be not detected at the moment when the campaign is released. So there's a small numbers game. Uh, Simon Tech counted 286 million different malware samples or virus samples last year. We counted about 4,000 vulnerabilities in all software and roughly 2,000 security vulnerabilities for, for programs that run on the Microsoft platform. So you see this is around 100,000 or more different malware samples that can be aimed at one single vulnerability. We come back later. So, further, if you have 10,000 samples that are uh, quality checked, then you release them in batches. So I start my campaign with the first batch is 1,000 samples, then I monitor the environment. When I see after three days they're getting detected by antivirus, then I know the next batches I have to release them within two days. So I stay always ahead of the game. And we have some numbers from uh, NSS Labs, an independent testing firm in the US. They tested up-to-date anti-malware products against all the exploits. Basically, they fired 123 known old exploits from the Metasploit exploit kit last year, in the middle of last year, against the uh, anti-malware product. So 25% were not detected against old ones. Then they slightly tweaked the exploits by retaining the core functionality, as cyber criminals do, by doing permutations, and then 40% were not detected. So this strategy, this malware development lifecycle is very, very effective. And Dambala, another company, they uh, are botnet hunters. They found out in a campaign when they looked at uh, what they found in major enterprises that up to 9% of the hosts of the endpoints in major enterprises are found to be bot uh, infected. So this means these are large enterprises that can afford the best of breed of defense technologies of IDS, IPS, proxies and uh, antivirus. So it can be bypassed systematically. I did the same with this demonstration. This Trojan I created, uh, it had when I created it back in 2009 in December, uh, just the Trojan by itself, the detection rate with virus total was 77%. Then I obfuscated it using one of the crypto tools I found also in the underground. Both tools were more than six months old at the time I did this exercise. The detection rate fell to 35%. Then I uploaded it every day to virus total and after 14 days the detection rate went up to only 61%. And I was shocked. I didn't pay anything for the latest version of malware tools and found that. And you can even have it as a service. Uh, this is Turkoyan, a remote administrative tool. You can get the gold version for $250 with a 9 months warranty, uh, replacement warranty, if it is detected by any antivirus. So we have tools made by the experts, we have processes behind it, and they have a high success rate. So the antivirus game changed a little bit in the last 10 years, so there were very few viruses hunted by many companies and uh, now it's vice versa. Okay, so to sum it up, what is the threats out there? Tools are created by the experts, they can be used by less skilled attackers. This leads to more opportunistic attacks and to highly automated attacks. Everything can be highly automated. So let's look at it from a cybercriminal's perspective. I have a pen testing background, so I, look, I like to look at it from the other's perspective. Basically, we can say the number of hosts times the number of vulnerabilities out there in the internet, this is pure opportunity for cybercriminals. Very simple model. What's the number of hosts? 
It's estimated by the end of 2010 there were approximately 2 billion internet users. This is 28% of the population of the Earth. This is a tremendous growth over the last 10 years. So if you have 2 billion potential targets, it is clear that corporate as well as private endpoints are increasingly targeted. Even if you have a very, very slight success rate with such a big, large number of targets, <coughs> it's still a good investment. What are the endpoints? Endpoints are very difficult to secure. If you compare it to a server, you have a mail server, you have a web server, whatever, the server is a static environment. It is locked down to only one single purpose. The server doesn't read PDF files, it doesn't watch movies, it doesn't surf, it doesn't chat. It doesn't install plugins and new software every once in a while. It's a very static environment. So it is manageable to secure them. However, if you look at the endpoint, the endpoint is a very dynamic environment. So we constantly install new features, we have a new lifestyle. So five years ago, YouTube was nowhere or not, not, not at large scale. So we start to watch movies now, we chat, we video chat. So the endpoint is very dynamic. We constantly install new technologies, plugins, uninstall and change stuff. This makes it a very hard to defend uh, target. Further, we have unpredictable usage patterns. So users are very creative in what ways they use and abuse the tools they have to get their job done. So we don't have that on servers. Further problem is at the end point or at the end of the day, all the valuable data you have is on the end point where it is the least protected. Whatever protection mechanisms you have, I have never ever seen a CEO or CIO or whatever management people working down in the server rack. No, you work at your end point. Whatever protection mechanisms you have in place at the end of the day to do your business, you have the data on your end point. So this makes endpoints a very valuable target and everybody is a valuable target. Even if you think you have nothing to hide, sorry, but an automated script cannot differentiate on that. If there's a vulnerability, you get owned. The scripts don't care whether or not you think you have something to hide or not. So what's the number of vulnerabilities? To know that or to look at that, we look at the typical endpoint. And so my question to you is, what do you think? How many programs do you have installed on your typical Windows machine? In front of you, privately, at home, or in business? Some estimates? 50? Other estimates? The others are all Mac or Linux users? Okay, let's look at it. So, First, my data source. My data source is Secunia PSI. This is a tool that is free for personal use. We have uh, now, mid-2011, we have more than 3.8 million users. It's a lightweight software scanner, so it identifies all the programs that are installed. It correlates this information with our vulnerability intelligence and then reports you back which programs are insecure. Insecure means that available patches are missing or the program is end of life, it's no more supported by the vendor. So I did some data mining in, in the data from these PSI users and what we found is that 50% of the users have more than 66 programs from more than 22 different vendors installed. So this gives us an impression of the average diversity that we find out in the field. So to security track that, I build now uh, a representative portfolio, so I, I call it the top 50 software portfolio. From all those scans I identified the 50 most prevalent programs, put them in a portfolio and now we can security track it. So in this portfolio we have software from 14 different vendors and the software is 26 programs from Microsoft and 24 programs from third parties, non-Microsoft programs. Those are the 50 programs. Now we look at the number of vulnerabilities over the last years affecting this typical endpoint having Windows XP as the operating system and this top 50 software portfolio and we found an alarming trend. So the number of vulnerabilities affecting your endpoint increased more than threefold from around 200 to more than 700 in less than or in, in three years. 
Now from 2009 to 2010, we have seen an increase of 71% in the number of vulnerabilities. This is an alarming trend and it is a relevant trend because more than 90% of these vulnerabilities are exploitable from remote. More than 70% of those vulnerabilities are rated as either highly or extremely critical and more than 50% provide system access upon successful exploitation. So, it's not nonsense vulnerabilities. It's vulnerabilities that give uh, attackers full access to your machine. Now, we wondered what happened in those years? What is responsible for this increase? So, is it the number of vulnerabilities found in the operating system? Is it vulnerabilities found in Microsoft products or vulnerabilities found in third-party products? When I analyzed this further, this is what I found. So in 2010, typical endpoint, 69% of all the vulnerabilities affected third-party programs. Only 13% affect the operating system and 18% affect uh, Microsoft programs. So again, if we look at it from the criminal's perspective, I see this is what you patch, and here I say, I don't care. Even if you are always fully patched on your Windows side, this is what everybody easily does with Microsoft Update, this does not affect cybercriminals' opportunity in any way. There's plenty of opportunity in the third-party programs. If I look at it from the other side, I split it up. I took the top 50 portfolio with Windows XP to the left, Windows Vista in the middle and Windows 7. I compared 2009 and 2008. Windows 7 was only released in autumn 2009, so I have no data here. We see gray, number of vulnerabilities in the operating system, blue, Microsoft program vulnerabilities, and red, third-party vulnerabilities. It's the same picture. Around 70% is in the third party. The big increase is almost exclusively due to vulnerabilities in third party programs. In other words, in 2010, we had 3.8 times more vulnerabilities in the 24 third party programs than in the 26 Microsoft programs. Or in the third party programs, we had approximately five times more vulnerabilities than in the, in the operating system. How does it change if you change your operating system? So we take the top 50 portfolio, look at it with Windows XP, Vista and 7 and the total number of vulnerability diminishes just by a little bit less than 3% if you change the operating system. So get me right, Windows XP is far more secure than Windows, uh, Windows 7 is far more secure than Windows XP. It's recommended to do that, but by thinking I'm getting rid of all the problems, this is not the case. So. How does this look like from the defender's perspective? I have one update mechanism to patch the operating system and the Microsoft programs. Thereby, I cover 31% of the vulnerabilities. As the top 50 portfolio has programs from 14 different vendors, we have to total to master 14 different update mechanisms. So, on top of that, I have to master another 13 update mechanism to patch the 24 third-party programs to patch uh, the, to cover the remaining 69% of the vulnerabilities. So, who can do that continuously? So, complexity is the worst enemy of security and cyber criminals are well aware. The patch available doesn't imply that the patch is installed. And we can measure that with our data. If I look at the average patch level, I find that Less than 2% of the Microsoft programs are found unpatched or unsecure in the PSI population. And at the same time, I found between 6 and 12% of the third party programs to be insecure. So this supports our theory that the complexity to do something, the complexity to stay secure, has a direct and measurable effect on your security level. The question now is. I see some worried faces. Are we doomed? Not really. If I look at those vulnerabilities in this portfolio over the last 24 months, I find that 65% of those vulnerabilities had a patch available at the day of disclosure. Usually we are very afraid and scared of zero-day exploits. Zero-day exploits are a real threat. 
But they are not as prevalent as we think. They are sexy, they get, let, they get lots, of, lots of press. But in 65% of the vulnerabilities, we can do something at the day zero. It's our patch process, it's not an external force, so it's our responsibility. Or within 10 days of disclosure, 75% of the vulnerabilities had a patch. So, can we if afford to ignore 65% of the solution to provide us security? <coughs> we can look at it from another perspective. What happens if you get compromised before a patch is released? So, you have the usual defense mechanisms, IDS, IPS, antivirus, firewalls and so on. We need those, but we have to be aware that every mechanism has its limitations. If you get owned, if you had all the other stuff installed, well, it can happen, you have a valid excuse. However, if you get compromised between the time when the patch was available, but before you have installed it, depending on your business and depending on your clients, you have a very, very hard time to explain why this has happened. After the patch is installed, you cannot be compromised anymore by using that vulnerability because the patch remediates the root cause. So, no matter how many virus samples are created, if they are targeted at one vulnerability, if you patch it, bang, game over for cyber criminals. So, based on that, I think we have to modify our model. So, opportunity for cyber criminals is number of hosts times number of vulnerabilities times the complexity to stay secure. If it is complex for us to stay secure, we find many vulnerable systems. The easier it is for us to stay secure, this lowers the opportunity for cyber criminals. So, this brings me to the most important slide. A patch provides better protection than thousands of signatures because it eliminates the root cause. With a patch, we can break that arms race with cyber criminals. It's more effective than signatures. The patch has some other advantages. It has no false positives. It has no false negatives. It introduces no latency and other delays, as we have seen in another talk. Provides better protection than thousands of signatures, and after installation, it does not consume any more additional resources, be it computation or memory or, uh, or uh, network or whatever. So, to conclude, today we still perceive Microsoft, the operating system, and Microsoft programs to be the main threat. Thereby, we largely ignore third-party programs. This is like locking the front door while the back door still is still wide open. Patching should be prioritized as a primary security measure, given its, its effectiveness. It's very often it's an operational measure and we have to do it, but we don't know really why and where and when. However, it should be prioritized as firewalls or as antivirus, given the effectiveness of fighting cybercrime and given the prevalence that 65% of the vulnerabilities had a patch available at day zero. So, what we need is controlled identification and timely patching of all the programs in your infrastructure and you need tools to do that. Who runs backups manually? Probably nobody, because if it is not a process, then it's doomed to fail when you need it most. So, it's the same for patching. How do you know what programs you have out there? If you do it manually, you're almost guaranteed to miss lots of opportunities or leave lots of opportunities for cyber criminals. So much from my side. Thank you for your attention. And I think we have some questions. There we go. Ah. So. Ah. Do you see that Okay, which of the following would best model cyber criminals opportunity?
Okay, so D is the correct answer. I see that 32% of the people have not been asleep. <laughs> so how can cybercrime systematically bypass parameter defense technologies? Okay, hey, hey, some people woke up. <laughs> Great. So for 2010, what's the distribution of the origin of vulnerabilities? B, correct, 30% in the Microsoft part and 70% in third-party programs. This is wisdom of the crowd. So why is patching an effective security measure? It's a claim, you can opt out if you want. Hey, great, 100% success rate for the crowd. Thank you very much. So, I'm open to questions. Why do you think uh, Windows have this distributed software model? Like Linux distribution, you have a central repository which checks and patches and you get all the software from a single unit and you count it. 14 patching mechanisms for an system. Why is that? Okay, so uh, Microsoft nowadays has a very good update mechanism. It's very efficient, it's very stable, we are experienced with it, we trust it. Uh, we approached the community and other vendors said, hey, we need something, we need a common unified patching standard. We, we did that about two years ago at ROSA conference, but the feedback we got was not very encouraging. Microsoft, for Microsoft, they could roll out patches for third-party programs with their uh, update mechanism. For them, it's a legal nightmare. So say, if they a patch for another third-party program, whatever, Adobe or uh, iTunes or whatever would fail, uh, they would be blamed. And this is a legal might nightmare they don't want to get into from the marketing and legal perspective. It's not the technological hurdle, you can do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Stefan Frey. Thanks to you.